Hi, this is an example problem from chapter 22 on electromagnetic induction, which is also known as Faraday's law and Lenz's law. Pause for a moment to read the question. So uh, we've got a picture of a uh, piece of aluminum wire that has been made into a closed circular loop. And there's a uh, magnetic field that is applied. It's a, it's a uniform field and it's pointing upwards in the direction of the positive z-axis as we've drawn the axes here. For the moment, uh, we can ignore uh, this other field here. We're going to talk, to that, talk about that one a little bit later here. But it's different than the uh, external magnetic field that we see here. All right, so in the first case, we're going to try to calculate what is the average induced EMF in the wire loop. Well, Faraday's law is going to tell us that. So the EMF, remember EMF is measured in volts. It's just like a battery, essentially. So the EMF here that's induced, it's going to be equal to minus N, which is the number of wire uh, turns or loops of wire. Here we just have one, multiplied by the change in the magnetic flux through the loop, divided by the elapsed time. Now in this case, uh, we, uh, and this is average, sometimes you see the bar, sometimes you don't, but the fact that it's a change here uh, that makes it an average. Um, I'm not going to bother writing the bar. I think I'll just leave it like that. It's always going to be average the way we do it. Uh, in this case, we want to just know the magnitude of this. So I'm only interested in the absolute value of these things. So I can go ahead and just look at this uh, as an absolute value. I just want the magnitude. It's going to be uh, N delta phi divided by delta T. And in this case, our loop is just equal to 1. So it all comes down to calculating the change in the magnetic flux through the loop divided by the time period. All right, so really the key focus here is on determining the change in magnetic flux. And so that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, we saw in a previous video how to calculate magnetic flux. So we've got this loop. And notice that we've got this area of the loop here, right? And uh, we can orient a normal line that is going to be perpendicular to that area. I'll do it in blue. I'm actually going to draw it right here next to the B field. There's my normal line. In choosing that normal line to point up rather than down, I've made the decision that positive magnetic flux is flux that flows upwards through in the direction of the normal line. And now you can see that the orientation of the normal line with the magnetic field, right? They're parallel and in the same direction. Therefore, the angle phi between them, it's equal to zero degrees. All right, so to calculate the change in magnetic flux, well, let's see, uh, it decreases from 0 0.6 Tesla down to zero. We know the final one is going to be zero in this case, right? Because it's going to go down to zero. No field will be passing through. There's no magnetic flux. But there's a couple ways we can think about doing delta phi. So let's look at it real quick. One way, of course, to do this is to write it like this. Uh, you do the uh, phi final minus phi initial. And that means B final, A final, cosine phi final minus the exact same stuff. There we have it in the initial configuration, right? However, another way to sometimes do this, which is easier, is to note that of all these things, right, the magnetic field, the area, and the angle, which can change, not all of them do change always, right? So another way to do this is just write this out like this. And we can say, OK, what's phi equal to? Well, phi is equal to b a cosine of this angle, little phi. And uh, if any of those things don't change, I can factor them out of the delta symbol. In this problem, the only thing that changes is the magnetic field because the orientation re remains the same. The area of the loop doesn't change. So we can factor out the things that aren't changing. And we can write it uh, like this. 
the uh, area of the loop multiplied by cosine of phi times delta b, where delta b is the only thing that's changing. I'm going to go ahead and use that second way of doing it. So if we use that equation, in this case we're going to have delta phi equals the area of the loop cosine phi, and now delta b, that's going to be b final minus b initial. And so we need to put the numbers in here. So the area of the loop, it's got a radius of 12 centimeters. So we're going to have pi times 0 0.12 meters squared. That's our area. Now we got to do cosine of the angle. Well, we said that that angle is 0. So this whole term here, cosine of 0 is 1, right? So there's double 1 here. And now the stuff that actually changed, B final, we know that that's 0, looking back up, and B initial started at 0 0.6 Tesla. And when we put those into the calculator, we get a value minus 2.71 times 10 to the minus second Tesla meters squared. And now all we need to do to complete part A is to put that value into the top equation for Faraday's law. So the, the magnitude of the uh, induced EMF, average induced EMF, again, it's the change in magnetic flux divided by the elapsed time interval. And we just calculated the change in magnetic flux this number, there it is. And the elapsed time interval while this was changing from 0.6 Tesla to 0 Tesla is 0 0.45 seconds. Which gives us a value 6.02 times 10 to the minus second. And remember I told you that this is just like a voltage, it's just like a battery. Uh, so it has units of volts. Again, the absolute value, we take the positive value, and so we get this uh, magnitude of the average EMF induced in the coil. All right, let's look at part B. What is the average electrical energy dissipated in the resistance of the wire? Well, the idea here is that the uh, induced EMF, it's like a battery. It has the same effect as if you put a battery into that loop of wire. And because of that, we're going to get a current to flow. And uh, given the current, we're going to be able to have uh, resistance in the wire generate electrical power. Or in other words, electrical energy that's dissipated in the resistance of the wire. So we're looking for the electrical power. What do we need to know to do part B? Well, we're going to need to know what the resistance of the wire is. And we're given this number here, which tells us how much resistance you have per unit length of wire. So we can use that to calculate the resistance. So let's go ahead and write that down here. So for part C, part B, sorry, uh, we know that uh, we've got 3.33 times 10 to the minus second ohms per meter of wire. And this wire has got a radius of 0 0.2 meters, so the circumference is going to be 2 pi r, right? We need to multiply this by 2 pi r. What is r? r is the 0 0.12 meters. And so this is going to give us the total resistance here for, for the uh, wire. Comes to 2.49 times 10 to the minus second ohms. Now, to, to finish off part B, we want to know what the uh, electrical power is, right? We want to know what P is equal to. In general, we can think of this, right? We think of this as IV. In this case, V is the EMF. And uh, Ohm's law also applies. So I can also say, uh, remember Ohm's law is V equals I R in this case V is the EMF. And so I can either calculate the current first using Ohm's law, 
or since I know the EMF and the resistance, I could go ahead and uh, use those things, right? So if I if I don't know the current, I can go ahead and just substitute in current is the EMF over the resistance from Ohm's law. We got this, end up with this value, and we just put our numbers in. There's the numbers we have from above, and putting those into the calculator gives us a value of 0 0.146 amps. Uh, shouldn't be amps, huh? This is power, should be watts. All right, so that's for part B. Now, it didn't ask us to do this, but let's just say we wanted to calculate the current as well, right? This is the current that is induced via electromagnetic induction in the coil. Uh, that would be the uh, EMF, the induced EMF divided by the total resistance of the coil. Uh, that's going to be, there's our numbers. And this comes out to 2.42 amps. Now, uh, let's think a little bit about what's going on here. So. We've got this changing magnetic flux from the magnetic field. Initially, it's you know pointed up, and then it decreases, right? This thing shrinks down. It's decreasing, and it goes down to zero. Uh, what is the electromagnetic induction going on? Well, Lenz's law says that the that nature does not like when you change the flux through a loop. The flux is decreasing. What does nature do to, to counter that? Well, it creates its own current here. And if you think of that current, use your right hand rule, you can see it there with the uh, hand. That current that's induced is going to produce its own magnetic field here. clean that up a little bit. So this current, induced current, it's going to produce over here this induced magnetic field because it's electromagnet, right? And so because this one's decreasing, this guy tries to keep the flux from going down by creating its own magnetic field there. Now that's how we answer part C. It says, viewed from above, what direction is the current in the wire, clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, the answer was already shown in the picture, right? But we know the thinking process is because the external field is shrinking, it's going down, nature doesn't like that, and it's going to respond by creating its own current in this direction because that is going to uh, produce a upward-pointing magnetic field that's induced to counteract the decreasing external field. So the first thing you do is you look at how the change in flux is. It's pointed up and it's decreasing. Therefore, nature responds, I need to make one point up because I don't want it to decrease. How do I make a, a uh, magnetic field point up? By using the loop as an electromagnet, well, we put a, a current in it, and we do it looking down, that would be counterclockwise, right? So the counterclockwise current opposes the change. That current is the induced current due to electromagnetic induction. So how do I explain part C? Well, the magnetic flux points up and is decreasing. To counteract the decrease, an induced magnetic field points up through the loop. The induced current must flow 
counterclockwise as viewed from above to produce this induced magnetic field according to the right hand rule number two.